good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. That name Jesus will get you in trouble today in America. Why is it do you think that just the mention of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ makes people so mad? They'll permit you to talk about everything else and everybody else's name. But if you say Jesus, heads will turn. You'll hear gasps all throughout the room. It gets people's blood to boiling when they hear the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 But there is none of the name given among men under heaven whereby a person can have a hope to know God. Right. Amen. 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 You know, there were two black Christians one time sitting together on the front row, front pew of their church, and they were just chatting. And one of them said, you know what, there's so many things in their, their Bible that I just don't understand and that bothers me so much. You know what I mean? And the other guy turned to him and said, well, he says, there's a whole lot of things in the Bible that I do understand, and that bothers me a whole lot. <laughs> the Word of God is not only for settled, settled in heaven, but it is one of the most awesome books ever given among men. Man has had the privilege of carrying in his hand an awesome set of scriptures for years. God has privileged us to have his word in our hands. There are peoples in this world who will never have the word of God translated in their, in their language. The only hope that they would ever have of knowing God is for somebody to go and tell them because they would never have the privilege of having the word of God in their own hands. There's not one single word that's put in this holy book out of which we preach that is not there for a reason. And sometimes it astounds me to see how God has messages even in particular sets of words. And so this morning, I want to choose a word and see how God can uh, meet, a, meet a need here. We want you to look at uh, your scriptures with us, and I hope you brought your Bible. I used to say jokingly, I think we ought to have a, a new office appointed in the church called the Bible Inspector. <laughs> that every Sunday, the first thing that would happen, you know, in, in a service is for the Bible Inspector to hit the aisle and start looking and see who has their Bibles and who doesn't have the Bible. And then, of course, charge a $20 fine <laughs> for all of those people who didn't have a Bible and then put it in the missionary fund. Sometimes there would be a big collection. We don't want to be without our scriptures, amen. Would you go with me over to Second Timothy? But well, just like a springboard verse of scripture, Second Timothy, we're going to look at verse chapter two, Second Timothy chapter two, and let's read uh, verses twenty and twenty-one. Second Timothy chapter two, twenty and twenty-one. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I would like us to look at that word vessel. We'll see it used many times in the scriptures and each time it's used, it seems to have a different lesson for us. Of course, there are different types of vessels mentioned. 
The exhortation of God's word is that every child of God should be a vessel of honor. That is, this container that we heard spoken of this morning in Sunday school about these bodies being so important to God and how that we ought to take care of them and how we ought to use them for the glory of God and how that uh, these bodies, of course, are his temple. Why he has chosen to dwell in us is up to him, but he has. This is a vessel because it contains the personage and the presence of God himself with us. This is the reason why he would like for us to treat it with great respect. I would imagine the brother, someone mentioned about tattoos and everything. This is the vessel of God. Therefore, God expects it to contain things that honor him. We should not put anything into it that would dishonor it. It's not a billboard. It's, it's something that we glorify God with when everybody in this heathen world looks at us. The first thing that they have a right to do is to see in us Christ Jesus by the way we use this body and by the way we act in it. So that would take care of a lot of problems, you see. And so God wants us to be vessels of honor, not vessels of dishonor. Now, everybody wants to have clean dishes, amen? Do you like to eat out of a dish that's been used for a week and a half without washing it? No, you don't. You want, you ladies, scrub your elbows off to try to keep plates and dishes and cups clean. Uh, you take and take a cup, throw it back in the dishwasher or in the sink if you see a spot on it. Some of you are so fanatics that if a little tiny innocent fly comes by and lands on the edge of a cup, you're going to wash it again, right? And he doesn't really eat that much and drink that much. But you know how it is. We want clean vessels to eat out of. And God wants clean and honorable vessels also. So, we're going to talk about three of them today in the scriptures, and I've entitled my little homily here this morning, Cook Pots, Water Pots, and Crack Pots. <laughs> pots are vessels, amen? amen? You're going to be amazed when you see lessons that God gives to us in simple things like vessels. I have another serious message on rooftop experiences. You would be surprised the great number of lessons that God taught people when they walk on top of the house. God's word is so wonderful and so complete that individual words can turn out to be great teachers for us and give us such significant truths and give it to us in such wonderful in different ways. So we're going to look at three of them this morning. Cook pots. What is a cook pot? You're going to see. And then water pots. And there are two of those that we'll be seeing. And then crack pots. Can God use crack pots? Yes, he can. Now we want you to go to the book of Exodus and I hope you'll use those scriptures that you have in your hands. It's what the word of God says that's important, not what the preacher says. Amen? Amen. Any preacher worth his salt will try to say exactly what God wants him to say and what God has in his mind. And may God enable us to do so. Exodus chapter 16. We're going to be using... Uh, both the Old and New Testaments this morning. In Exodus chapter 16, let's look at the first six verses and we'll see the first vessel or we'll see the first pot mentioned here in the scriptures. And they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the house of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departure out of the land of Egypt. You know we're now uh, at the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt 
this is taking place right after that. Verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. It doesn't take people long enough to start griping about anything, especially when things are not to their comfort and conveniences. Verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the what? Flesh pots. The flesh pots. And when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, and I may prove that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. We see the first pot here mentioned, the cook pot of Egypt. It's called a flesh pot here. Evidently, when the children of Israel were in bondage and slavery down in Egypt, they fed them in a communal style. That is, they had these big cauldrons or pots that they would boil and they would throw about anything that they could find and do it. They made up a mess of something for them to eat. They were not worried about cooking for them an excellent cuisine. They were not worried about a di balanced diet. These Egyptians were merely interested in feeding these children who were slaves, whatever they could get their hands on. And don't you know that these Israelites had griped when they had to go up every day and look in that pot and wonder what it was <clears throat> looking back at them. And they would have to eat it and to be satisfied with it. It was just a mess of almost anything. They were led out by God in a miraculous fashion out into the desert and they hadn't been there very long when they turned around and started accusing Moses of having led them out into the desert to deliberately kill them. And here they are, so soon saying, oh, I wish we were back in Egypt when we at least could go to the flesh pots of Egypt and have something to eat. The, <clears throat> this pot here, this flesh pot of Egypt is a pot that could represent sin and separation to us today. Egypt, since time immemorial, has been a type of the world. Whenever you see people going back into Egypt, it was a type of people wanting to go back into the world. Egypt represents everything that this world has to offer to a person. It represents the needs of the flesh, the human desire of a person, the world and its lust. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That is the exhortation of the precious word of God. Here we see the children of God in such short time wanting to run back to Egypt where they could sit down by the flesh pots or the communal cook pots of everything that Egypt had to offer to them. What is the lesson that we can learn from that today as God's children? When things get tough and things might not be convenient, like the people down in Louisiana right now are perhaps experiencing. No lights for months or for a month. No refrigeration and no air condition. 
The humidity is so high. Everybody's uncomfortable. The people are going to begin to gripe and always expect something to be better than it is. And often God's children can be guilty of the same thing. When things get tough and things get difficult, are we as God's children going to be tempted so quick to run back down to Egypt to expect this world to do something for us? Are we going to look to God to give us the needs that we have and the things that he desires for us? As we look around us today, especially as we look north to Washington, as you click on the television and listen to the, all of the perversions that come out of the mouth of politicians today, and see how that our very freedoms and how our faith is being snatched out from under us and corrupted today. When things really get tough and the economy collapses and the grocery stores are emptier than they are now and there's not even a roll of toilet paper anywhere and there's not a hamburger patty to be found in any meat case, when it gets really tough and they begin to call in loans and people begin to have to sell every toy that they have. The roadsides will be filled with jet skis and boats and motorcycles and the toys that people have bought in their luxurious days. When the going gets tough and the economy crumbles and America is put to the test, are you and I, as God's children, going to run back to the flesh pots of Egypt and expect the government to do something for us and expect Washington to bail us out, are we going to stay true and look to God? Do you see the cook pots of Egypt? Now let's look at the next one. We're going to go to, to the New Testament now in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. It comes right after chapter 3. <laughs> Somebody says, I can't find John chapter 4. And I said, well, I'll help you. It comes right after chapter 3 before chapter 5. That's really big help, right? <laughs> what would a lot of people do if the index were not in the Bible, right? Jokingly, have you ever been in a situation that you didn't know where Habakkuk was? And you had to try to look at your index in your Bible without your person sitting next to you knowing that you were looking at the index. Because you wanted them to not, they didn't, you didn't want them to know that you didn't know where it was. And you needed to find out where it was because the preacher was about to get there. And how am I going to look in the index without my neighbor seeing me get there and get to Habakkuk in time enough to go on? Have you ever been in that fix? Uh, you know, like that preacher one time says, okay, we want everybody to open your Bibles now to the book of Zechariah uh, or Zephaniah or Hezekiah. Would you everybody open your Bibles to Hezekiah? <laughs> it's embarrassing when half the congregation starts looking, <laughs> especially when there are not such books in the Bible on certain occasions. But here we are in chapter, uh, chapter 4 of John. And let's read verses 24 through 29. Are y'all with me this morning? John chapter 4, verses, verse 24. God is the Spirit. Let me make sure I'm there where I'm supposed to be. John chapter 4, verse 24. All right. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. You know, this is the woman at the well Jesus is talking to here to give you the immediate context of it. Verse 27. And upon this came his disciple. And that means about this time, his disciples came and marveled that he talked with the woman. She was a Samaritan, you see, and no Jew talked, no respectable Jew talked 
to a Samaritan uh, and uh, if he could get away with it. And uh, yet no man said, what seeketh thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Here it is. The woman then left her what? Water pot. And went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Here we see the water pot. Now, if you had the, had, would have the privilege to go to a lot of the mission fields like we have, you could notice that out in the third world countries that one of the morning duties of the lady of the house was to go to the river with a large jug balanced on her head. She could go down there to the river and fill that jug up, and sometimes it was like a five-gallon can. And they would take a towel and roll it up and make a roll and put it right on the top of their head and set that big bucket on top of their head and bring five gallons of water to the house, walking for a half a mile and never touch the bucket, balancing it on her head and getting it there. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is in a lot of the other countries of the world. Water pots were so important and this lady had gone to the well to get the water for that day's supply. And when she was got there, when she got there, of course, she had an encounter with Jesus that she was not bargaining for. And you know all about that. And after Jesus talked to her and witnessed to her and astounded her, she was so impressed with it, guess what she did? She took off and left her water pot sitting right there by the well. She just went right off and didn't care least about that pot being left there. Now these pots, these for this water pot can stand for surrender or for submission of the children of God. How is this a lesson to we children of God here? This woman was so concerned about what she had heard from the mouth of the Savior that she forgot everything else and left it all behind and took off to tell everybody in the village about Jesus. This is when a child of God is willing to forsake everything and to put God first in his life. She didn't say, well, wait a minute, I got to get my pot and then I'm going to go tell everybody. One of the most difficult things for a lot of people in our day and age is this. Once they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, it is so difficult for them to leave the things of the world behind. It seems like that they're always wanting to go back to it. The old way of living is always returned to sooner or later. That is the reason why today the average convert in the church lasts for three months. Because when the preacher preaches the first message on tithing, they hit the foreleg. Because they cannot leave the things of the world behind. When new converts find out that they can't run around and carouse like they used to, when a new convert finds out that he can't talk the way he used to talk anymore. When a new convert finds out that the old things of the world have got to be put away, they find that too much because they don't want to give up these things of the world. They want what Christ has got to offer, but they also want to hold on to what the world has given to them. This woman just forgot all about her water pot after she met Jesus. I know some men that don't, don't misunderstand the men. There are a lot of controversial topics. The brother who preaches in Sunday school knows this. When you're preaching, sometimes you can always rub somebody wrong, even though you don't mean to. Now, deer hunting time it's coming, right? Amen. How many men go deer hunting here in the CNS? Well, I knew there's bound to be some up here. Wherever there's woods, there's hunters, right? <laughs> Wherever there's a deer, this time of year, they meet somewhere down in the thicket and say, 
you know we ain't got for 10, 15 more days. We got to have a plan here because they're going to come in here and we got to know what to do. Now, let me tell you something. The I, I reason I say that I live in the middle of the city of Petersburg and right, and I just have two little acres of woods behind my house down there. And guess what? Sometimes I've counted 25 deer in that one little piece of woods during the middle of the winter time in the middle of the city. And I know it's because they say, well, let's go in there. We're in the city. Ain't nobody going to shoot us down there. <laughs> and I can see where they've rubbed the horns all on the trees and laid already. And I see their little uh, love offerings laying around everywhere. <laughs> you know how it is. And now, don't take me wrong, man. I'm not against deer hunting. But remember this. You don't know how many Christians that uh, men that when deer hunting season gets here, they put the things of the Lord on hold. It's the same thing about anything else. Like the little boy. Little, we're going to go on vacation. He was in there packing his suitcase. He picked up his Bible and said, well, I don't reckon I'll need this because I'm going on vacation. Is there a time in the life of a Christian, once we've been saved, that we can put the things of God in the secondary position and what we are used to in the first position? When we read the verse of Scripture that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, does that mean everything or just certain things? What does it mean, folks? Everything has to come under his control. Remember this. When Christ redeemed us and paid for us with his precious blood, you can understand why the verse of Scripture starts, What? Know ye not that ye are bought with a price? Even the precious blood of Jesus, therefore glorify God in your bodies, because ye are not your own, you're bought by him? Does he have a right to tell us what to do? Yes. The water pot of submission. This woman became so enamored with what the Savior was saying, she forgot all about the reason for coming to the well. She forgot about washing dishes. She forgot about her drinking water. She forgot about cooking. She had met Jesus and she took off to tell everybody about him and just smack dab left her water pot, which probably was a very valuable possession, just left it sitting right there at the well. And many times, folks, that's what we're going to have to do when it comes to serving the Lord. We're going to have to forget things and move out to Jesus first. He's going to see to it that our needs are met. Amen. But don't put the need first in him second. We should never be guilty of putting the cart before the horse. That's the water pot. Now let's look at another pot. Another water pot. Look at John chapter 2. Let's go back two chapters here. John chapter 2. This is at the marriage of Cana. Jesus was there. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They had no wine. Now remember the word wine here is used. Grape juice, which was can be interpreted grape juice or wine. Nine times out of ten, it is unfermented beverage, but they use the word wine in the translation. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I got to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. They ran to him and say, Hey, Jesus, the, the wine has played out. And Jesus said, Well, what is that to me? What, 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 what am I supposed to do about it? His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots 
of stone. There are the water pots sitting there, probably somewhere in the patio, and they, they were having this wedding celebration there in the patio, which you have to know the way they built their houses. They built their houses around a central courtyard. No such things as front yards and backyards. Your yard was in the middle of your house, and your house was built around it. Everything went on in the patio. Once in a while, you would have a room on the roof where you had an oven and you had a set, a set of steps from the street up to the rooftop. And that was the way it was in those days. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And uh, he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. You know what? Jesus, they came to Jesus and said they, they've run out of wine. And, and Jesus' mother said, do, what he, do, what they, do, do what he tells you to do now. And it just says there were six water pots sitting there. Now, this has a lesson for us. This is submission. How? Jesus says, well, I need some water pots. And this brother said, well, we don't have any here. Anybody here got any pots that we can have? I, I got one at home. We'll run down and get it real quick. Didn't have to do that, did they? Why? Because there were six water pots there on standby right there that were ready to be filled and to be used by the Savior. What is the message we have for of this? When it comes time for Jesus to use us, we don't have time. To, he doesn't have time to start looking for a vessel of honor. We should be on standby. We should be there ready to go when he calls us to do something. When God needs something to do in his work, he doesn't have time to look for somebody to do it. There ought to be Christians ready and on standby to do it at a moment's notice. I'm sorry to say, but a lot of times I've been in the work of God long enough to know some years. I've been serving the Lord over 45 years, or well, over 50 years, really. Usually when you want something to be done for the Lord, you have to almost beg for somebody to do it today. Well, I don't have no education. I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. Somebody else can do it better. I don't have no skills. I don't know. And then finally you bring them enough and coerce them enough and they'll get down to doing it. We need to be water pots on standby for Jesus. That the instant that he needs us, we're there ready to be filled and to be used of him. Are y'all mad at me? Is that good? Amen. Do you want to be on standby for Jesus that they have to always look for you? Are you where you need to be when God needs you? This is the wonderful thing that the things like pots teach us from the word of God. So there we have the water pots, one by the left by the well in, in Samaria, and the other six on standby in the patio at Cana of Galilee. Well, that brings us to the crack pots. Have you ever felt like a crack pot? Well, we're going to see. Go back to the Old Testament now, to the book of Judges. We're going to go to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomius, or whatever. We're going to hit past what? Past Joshua, and on hitting the book of Judges, chapter 7. Judges, chapter 7. Here we are at the crack pots. We've seen the flesh pots and the cook pots. We've seen the water pots. Now let's see the crack pots. We're all supposed to be vessels of honor to the Lord. Judges chapter 7, verse 16. And he divided, you know who this is about here. This is about Gideon. You know the context when we get into it. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers. 
there is the pot, there is the vessel, and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that, as I do, ye shall do, or so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets which on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. There's the crack pots. They cracked the pots wide open. Now you know the story of Gideon. What was the purpose of this story? They had a pitcher, a vessel, a clay vessel. It held water under normal circumstances. They put a mecha or a light inside of this pitcher. You couldn't see it. In that hand, they had a light inside of a pitcher. Nobody could see it as long as it was in the pitcher. The other hand, they had a trumpet. Boom! Scared the daylights out of all around the camp. They thought it was a whole army surrounding them with a terrible noise. Bash! They cracked the pot, and guess what? All these lights started shining. All of a sudden, and it scared them to death. The enemy's right on top of us. Let's get out of here. And they ran like a bunch of confused rats all around. And guess what? The victory was Gideon's, right? Because, and the, through, through the, the Lord's victory through Gideon, as the lady pointed. Listen, folks. The light can't shine until the pot is cracked. God likes to use broken vessels for his service. Because until God breaks the vessel, the light can't shine like it's supposed to. The enemy can't see the light of God until the pot is cracked. As long as we're in control of things, we allow ourselves to hide the light. But once we are broken in the way that the Lord wants to, sometimes the Lord breaks us in his own inevitable way. Sometimes he uses difficulty. Sometimes we are so hard to be broken that God has to take something precious away from us. Sometimes the trial has to be so severe that we can almost bear it before we are broken and our spirit is broken and the world is allowed to see the gospel shining through us the way it's supposed to. Gideon and this few handful accomplished a great miracle just 300 pitchers and 300 trumpets were used. God can do great and mighty things in, with his people, with so few of us, if we're broken to ourselves. If we take ourselves out of the way and let the light that he has put in us shine. We get to the principle, this brother, this morning, about what do we do to this body? When they look at us, what do they see in us? Do they see a light or do they see a light hidden under the bushel? The Bible says that when you light a candle, you don't put a bushel basket over top of it so nobody can see it. But you take that bushel basket off of the top of it and you put it on a candlestick so everybody in the world can see what's going on. Now, what do you want people to see when they look at your body? Do we want them to see the marks that Jesus put on us? The tattoo that Jesus put on us? Everybody can see the invisible tattoos that God puts on us. As a matter of fact, in the, in the Bible it says one time the people took notice that they had been with Jesus. Why? Because they could see the effects on their life and they knew that they had had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been broken. The pitcher had been removed. They were a vessel of honor, and the light was shining, and the world saw it. 
There are wonderful lessons in the Bible, even in things like vessels. Cook pots of Egypt can stand for worldly things seething and boiling with all kinds of the world's offerings. If we want to run back to that every time something happens to us, that makes us fair with a Christian. Then there are water pots represented here. We need to forget those things which are behind because Christ has newer things for us at the beginning. And once we set those things of the world aside, like that water pot of Samaria, then we become like the water pot of Cana and are on standby for the Lord's service. And then he takes this earthen vessel of clay and he breaks it. And he molds us and he makes us after his will. And we see the will of the Father. We see the prerogative of the Son. We want to seek everything that he wants. Because we want all that we are to shine so that others can see. What Washington needs are shining Christians. We want to stand up for our rights and defend our rights, but let me tell you something, folks. Before we speak up, we need to shine out. May God help us to be crackpots for the Lord. And if they think you're nuts, tell them that's okay. It's a good thing to be broken by the Lord. Amen? Amen. There it is. Cook pots, water pots, and crack pots. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning, if we know our hearts, we want to be a people that show our love for thee. Since the day that we ask thee to come into our hearts as personal Savior, thou hast placed in us what a desire to know thee more. And if that desire is not there, maybe it's because we go back to the world too much. We love you, Lord, this morning. And we're living in perilous times. We're living in days in which the Savior of the world has been forgotten. All of the truths of God's word are being perverted. Things that are seemingly logical to us are perverted by this world and become ludicrous. Help us, Lord, to be shining lights in a wicked place. Help us to realize that one day we will give an account as to what the wattage of our light bulbs was. Help us, Lord, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We know that if we do, you will provide everything that we need. Help us to be on standby, Lord, ready to be used of thee. Help us to leave the old ways behind. Break us, Lord. Mold us and make us after thy will. While we are yielded, quiet and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the power and we are the clay. Mold us and make us after thy will while we are waiting, yielded, and still. Bless this church beside the highway. 
May it shine in this county. May Jesus see the lights. May the world see them more. May we be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning.